So excited for you to join us today on this episode. I'm here with our guest, Carpenter Mann. She's an entrepreneur, a yoga teacher, and the co-founder of the Women of Color Summit. She's also been a yoga teacher for the music festival, Lightning in a Bottle, two years in a row, which is super cool. And Harpener is somebody I know from college. We were in the same business fraternity together, and I was really glad to reconnect with her when I moved to LA two years ago because I knew that she had become an entrepreneur. We're going to talk about that, how she moved from corporate to what she does now. And really exciting because Harpender is actually one of my earliest subscription customers for the Daily Work Journal. Right before we started recording. Got it right here. Yes, love <laughs> it. We were just talking about, it shocked me, but Harpner says she has eight daily work journals in her possession, which means she's been a subscription customer for two years at least. So I'm really excited for her to share with us how that has been going for her, how she's been continuing journaling and specifically with the daily work journal, which is really special because not all the guests here on the show are customers of daily work journals. So welcome to the show. So happy to have you. I'm so happy to be here. Yeah, I was telling you before we started recording, I ended up going to a friend's house earlier than I thought. I didn't have my work stuff on me. I didn't have my daily work journal. And I was just like sitting there and I was like, wait, what am I supposed to do with the rest of my day? I don't have my journal and all the things I've written in it. And I was just laughing at myself and I was like, man, I have become dependent. And this is not an ad in any way. This is just <laughs> yeah. actually my real feelings. Yeah. And I'm a subscription holder because it's just so easy. So yeah, I'm a huge fan of the Daily Work Journal. I'm excited to be here to chat about my journey into entrepreneurship, being a full-time yoga teacher. When we were together at UCLA, like we were in the same business frat and AKSI. And at that time, it was people were split up into these little like groups. It was like either you're like an investment banker or you're in like the big four accounting yes. or like a consultant. Yeah, yeah. like you, you were on that consulting yeah. path. Consulting and then there were like the stragglers that were like, what are we into? <laughs> and I remember a couple of them into marketing. And I was like, I guess like I will be good at that. And then I spent many years in like sales and like events and marketing. And now for the last five years, I've been a yoga teacher and I work with teens. I work with private clients. I'm really passionate about working with folks of color. And I just feel very grateful to be on the path that I am because yoga completely transformed my life and being able to help other people learn about yoga to get to be on the path as well. is just, I feel very lucky to be to be able to do this work. Oh my gosh. I just felt a warm sensation in my heart when you said that. Aww. I love hearing when folks love, enjoy what they do and we'll definitely talk about that. Let's rewind to the moment. We had a college, you had a marketing job. And I believe if my memory serves me correctly, at some point you moved to Australia, I think mm -hmm. with your then boyfriend, now fiance, right? Mm -hmm. And and you still had the same job. Tell us about that. Yeah. Out of UCLA, thank you. Thank you to AK Psy. Like I, I got really good at interviewing. And so I left UCLA or towards the end and had like multiple offers. And I was like, what do I want to choose? What do I want to do? And I ultimately ended up choosing like their Bloomingdale's executive store development program. I was only there for a year and I was like, I got to get out of here. This is <laughs> not for me. It was like in Century City and people are spending $10,000. And my interest is really helping people make meaningful impact with their work and their life, not mm -hmm. spending thousands of dollars on like bed sheets and jeans. And it's just, it wasn't a match. It wasn't an alignment match, but I left that. And the job that I was working for after it was a small education consulting startup, we would help kids. Most of our clients were in India get into college. So we spent a lot of time, like a month or a couple months, like going to India, I would meet with the kids, their parents host events. And I was like the director of marketing and the director of sales. And I was like, I am 22. Like who gave me this position? But I have a <laughs> job. I'll, I'll toot my own horn. But I took that job with me when I moved to Australia. But then when I moved to Australia, Things shifted and I ended up actually working at a tech startup, although it was like pretty big at that point. So had moved past the startup stage, but like a tech company in working, doing like business development. And I did that about a year and a half while I was in Australia. Tell us a little bit more about how 
you had the idea of quitting your corporate career and then becoming a yoga teacher? I feel like I just most of my life have always just been like, I want to be my own boss. Like I want to have freedom. I think freedom to me was the biggest thing that I was wanting to attain. And I think that also just came from being raised with really like controlling traditional, like Indian parents and being the eldest daughter. And so freedom was something that was just very like idealistic and like, how do I get this? And so like when I was thinking about like job prospects, just the idea of going to a location for 40, 50 hours, you have to go. I remember at Blooming Girls, I'd be like, hey, I need to take this time off, like that time off. I have these important things going on. They're like, oh, you can't because we need you. And I was just like, excuse me, these things are more important to me than you need me to work because you're having a big sale. That's <laughs> y'all's problem to figure out, not my problem. And I think that to me was just like, a, okay, I need to work for myself. So I think I've always had this, I want to work for myself. I want to make an impact. I want to be service oriented. I met my co-founder early 2020. I had been like also going to silent meditation retreats and doing breath work and just getting all this inspiration of who I want to work with, who I want to impact. And what I kept getting was like, you have, you need to work with BIPOC. You need to keep practicing yoga yourself and like learning more. And I have a strong interest in psychology and like philosophy, but it was really like with the woman of color, something we created it. And it really seemed like this could be something. And it was like that along the combination of, I was starting to get private clients. Like I wasn't advertising it, but I had someone reach out to me on Instagram. Who's now one of my closest friends. I had someone reach out to me on LinkedIn. Hey, Hey, do you teach private yoga? And I was like, I don't, but I I guess I do now. Um, And so I feel like it got to a point where I was making enough doing the Women of Color Summit, teaching yoga that I was like, I feel like there's always like a tipping point that you reach where it's just, okay, like I could use all this time that I'm putting into my full time, invest that in this thing that I'm trying to grow. And I see potential here. Yes. And I just reached a point, it was actually on my birthday in 2020 that I quit. I was like, I'm going to go in on this full time. And now it's been three years and I just can't yeah. imagine like working full time for someone <laughs> unless it was like really like special. Yeah. Okay. Rewind back to the moment where you were getting the download on want- working with BIPOC. Do you remember those moments that happened or were, are they, what exactly happened that made you think that? I like can remember those moments so clearly. The first one I was at of a Poshna retreat. So like a 10 day silent retreat. And the most recent one I went to was last year. And I mean, like you don't have your phone. There's no music. You're not talking to anybody. There's just like, and you're meditating for anywhere from six to 10 hours a day, maybe a little less. <laughs> yes. Um, I've never been to one, but it always sounds really long and obviously really intense. Yeah. But I find in all that really forced silence, there is space for the wisdom to show through. I was writing something about meditation a couple of days ago where I was writing, we meditate for many reasons, but one reason we meditate is so we create like more space between the thoughts, like one thought, there's six, and then you keep creating that space. And in that space that you have created by meditating, like you become a little bit more relaxed. And as we become a little bit more relaxed, like there's space for that wisdom to come in. There's space for that part of you that kind of really knows whether it's like ancestors or spirit guides or God, that's always there nudging you. And it creates space for that part to be like, hey, like you should do this. And so at the 10 day silent retreat, I was having that. I was just getting all these messages And a couple months later, I did an hour long breathwork session with a wonderful teacher in New Orleans. And it just came to me so strong. And I'm like in the breathwork, like crying and screaming and it's a mess, but it's a good mess. Um, And it just came through of like who you need to work with and how, and like these ideas. And I think that to me is such a reminder of like why I need to continue to practice because what we're feeding into 
what we're focusing our attention on just continues to grow and amplify. And doing those practices like create space for the wisdom to come in, to think a different way or to not think at all, actually, to just feel. And I even think to like this past Sunday, I went to the, I think it's called Love Long Beach Festival. Okay. And there's this group of bhakti yogas together. And bhakti yoga is the yogis that are like incredibly devotional to God, devotional to divinity. And we did a 20 minute Om chanting circle. And by the end of it, I just felt like a new person. And I felt so much more like loving And that was such a reminder to me of the power of being in community, of practicing, of being on this path, because it moves me personally from a place of like fear to a place of trust. And I think I'm always trying to get myself back to that place of trust. I think especially as like woman of color, first gen, daughter of immigrants, I feel like I was raised hearing a lot of, we don't have money to that. We can't afford that. And like, at one point, all of us lived in like a one bedroom apartment. I feel like that scarcity and just also like actual reality of so many of us are not that far from like poverty or just like oppression is real. And so for me, these practices are like, okay, I can trust instead of getting really freaked out. Yeah, that is so cool to hear. I have the end state of what you just described too. I feel like for me from moving from fear to trusting is what I'm constantly wanting to do and I do. But the method of which I do that is so different from what you just described. I've never heard of bhakti yoga. Uh, I'm not, did not go to love. I was in Costa Rica. Yeah. And for me, it is, is actually just talk. It's almost like it must be talk therapy in a way, but it's just me talking to people, me making connections with people, Mm -hmm. hitting my friends up for lunch, dinner, whatever it is. And just feeling, I think I'm in this moment for a purpose. If I can't see it, it is for something that I don't know Mm -hmm. yet. But I feel a divine spirit that's guiding that. But it manifests to me through my friends Mm -hmm. and like the communities that I'm a part of. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, thank you for sharing. And I think that's also that power of community, sangha, like, relationships where you're around people that can like mirror or reflect back to you what you're needing or wanting or like working through things because like I also have been working with like my talk therapist probably for the last six years now like the same person every week nice and like it's so good to just like flush things out and have someone remind you and be like, Hey, remember the thing you were freaking out about like last year and had all worked out? Like maybe this situation will be the same too. And I'm like, shut up. Let me like freak out right now. (laughs) So yeah, I like totally resonate with that. Yeah. So you have an amazing resume of yoga. You've got just a lot of different types of yoga training. Tell us a little bit more about how you pick those and what kind of drew you to them, or is it just hitting all the cornerstones? Yeah, that's a good question. So because of that job that where I was spending like months at a time in India, I was pretty stressed out. I was like anxious and I just normally run more anxious. That's just the tendency of the mind that I have. And I was like, wait, I'm in India. This is where yoga is from. I should (laughs) go practice. That's awesome. And I literally just put in my phone yoga ashram, yoga center. And I think I I feel like I literally just looked by whatever was closest to me and like maybe had good reviews. And I feel like I saw something on the website too, where I was like, "Mm, this feels like real, whatever that real feeling was to me at that time. And it was the Ananda Sangha and they're in the lineage of Parhamsa Yoga Ananda. And I think he's also set up the Self-Realization Fellowship is also him. And I ended up, they also have a center in LA. So when I got back, I kept studying with them. So I like studied with Ananda Sangha probably like a year and a half. Then when I moved to Australia, I was trying to find something similar and it just didn't exist as far as I was looking. There was no Ananda Sangha in Brisbane, Australia, Mm. but I was like, I still want to keep practicing yoga. And I found a studio that was like near my office and then they just happened to be running a yoga teacher training. And so this yoga teacher training very much like vinyasa teacher training. So I got a lot of good experience with learning alignment and sequencing 
And the teacher was good. Her main teacher was Patabi Joyce. So there at least was like that kind of direct lineage. So that was really helpful. And I remember because of that training, I used to wear a belly. This is such a tangent, but I used to wear a belly button like ring. Oh, nice. And she was talking about like how energy can be disrupted if you have a piercing there. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I ended up probably a couple of days later, just taking it out. And I really felt a difference. Oh, dang. Yeah. And if, and I was like, if anything, like the difference I felt was like the belly button ring was sometimes just get stuck on clothing. I'm just aware that it's there. And I took it out and it was like one last thing my mind had to like concern itself with. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. But I ended up doing that first yoga teacher training just because it was like the closest thing nearby in the year since. So I try to like be continuously studying and learning. And a lot of it was just following my curiosity. What do I want to study? What do I want to learn? And so I took a prenatal yoga teacher training and I love working with pregnant folks. It's so much fun. Also just really meaningful. I've taken like a mental health and wellness yoga teacher training. I've taken a 300 hour advanced yoga teacher training. I was just saying last week, I'm opening my back, my, myself back up to another training, another study or a teacher to come into my life. And so I think a lot of it was just like following curiosity, seeing what's available. And I try to go back to India every year and I'm going back next February to go study somewhere. Wow. I love that. Now that you have all this training under your belt and you have all the clients that you do have, how do you decide what your workday is going to look like and how you want your career? to? I feel like I really do have like seasons this year from January until the beginning of July. Like I put a lot of my clients on pause and I stopped taking new clients. I didn't do any marketing. I didn't reach out to anybody. So I could focus solely on the book. So that yeah, was like, tell us about that. yeah, that was like six books, six months, just like focus on the book. Yes. Writing a book, not easy. And six months also is incredible. Yeah. Yeah. When you have to tell us how you got the wanting the idea of wanting to write this book. I think I've always just wanted to write a book. It's one of those things you're like young and you're looking out. And for me, it was, and I've loved reading for as long as I can remember. Like I would read three books in a day. And so I think I was always like, I want to write a book as well. Although when I was younger is more like fiction books that I, and like stories I wanted to tell. Do very much believe in intention setting and like putting your energy into the things that you want. And so in the last couple of years, I have been putting out, I want to write a book. But for this book, like the publisher reached out to me and he was like, are you interested in writing a book about this topic? And I was like, is someone pulling a prank on me? That was like my initial, like this can, this is just too good to be true. He is incredible. Like he's been so supportive and allows me to take charge like creatively and like on the content. Um, I'm actually like in the editing stage right now. So he's going to get me back all the notes next right. Tuesday. Um, so I'm like, okay, wait, hold on. What is the, to- what is the topic of the book? Uh, so the book is called liberating yoga. And it's talking about how in the West yoga is perceived just as an exercise, just as a body based modality. And my book is talking about how there's so much more to yoga. Like yoga is a philosophy. It's a way of life. It's a spiritual practice practices. Um, it's a way for us to build the relationship with life. And I think like the knowing the more about yoga will make like a great impact on the collective. And so I like interview different teachers and professors, practitioners, and it's also speaking to how a lot of like South Asian BIPOC folks are missing or erased from the kind of like the yoga scene. So it's like, how do we uplift these folks instead of what we see now? Yeah. I cover a lot of different topics in the book. So I'm, yeah, I'm interested to see like how it does. I had to move from a place of, I felt a lot of like constriction around how is this book going to do? How is it going to be received? 
And I really had to realize like, those are things not within my control. Um, and just to let go of that, I was like, what I can focus on is the content within the book, the time and the devotion that I put into it. But beyond that, it's really not within my control. And I just, I can't stress out about it, but that's also like a realization that came to last week. So this enlightened realization is new before that I was like a bundle of nerves and stress. Oh my gosh. But yes, do they give you like a timeline that you have to hit or how did you manage your private client workload and writing at the same time? And I would imagine if you had a writer's block, how would you get over that? So he was like, what do you think about a deadline of June 30th? And I was like, sure, why not? And then that kind of really hit me, like what it means to write a book in six or seven months. And I was like, okay. I was like, I need to, I saw, I just sat down. I was like, how much do I need to pay my bills? And I was like, anything beyond that, I was like, right now, I can't take on. And so I really stripped down to the bare bones. I can only work with these clients. I'm not going to market for any more. And I'm good. I just like my main focus right now. And I, I had to put a lot of projects on pause to focus on the book. I was like, my main focus is the book. And I feel grateful that I was in a position to be able to do that. Like I live with my... Beyonce's like family. So there's a lot of things in the budget I don't necessarily need to worry about. So I I feel very lucky to have been in this situation that I got to do that. And I took off time completely from all my clients for some of May and then all of June to finish the book. Do you have a time frame for yourself in a day? How much you have to write? Oh my God. It was such a learning curve. I learned so much about myself. I learned so much about the creative process. I realized that I write really well in the morning. So I had to make it so that in the schedule, my morning was open. So my morning was open for at least two hours. So I could write for two hours. The crunch period really came to like in June where I was like, oh my God, it's due June 30th. And so for two weeks, I just cleared my schedule completely. I went for some of it to Joshua Tree and I would write from like the time I would wake up, do my practice and start writing from about like 9 a.m. until about 4 p.m. I take breaks to eat, to stretch, bathroom, go out in the sun, meditate, cry. Just like, how am I going to do this? And that was really like a sprint. Otherwise it was a marathon. And I know you mentioned or asked earlier about the writer's block. Like I had a book coach. I still have a book coach who's wonderful. And she would say every time at a writer's block, go do something fun. Go take care of yourself. You're not going to get through this writer's block by forcing it. Like you need some inspiration right now. And so that would then force me to, okay, yes, I'm going to go hang out with my friends. I'm going to go to the beach. I'm just going to, that's a sign that I just need to like, let it go for now. But writer's block is it's pretty infuriating. So it's yeah, I'm, I'm sure. I, that like intersects with, I think a lot of people come to me about procrastination. Mm-hmm. But like they say they want to do something, but they also tell me, but I don't think I have the strength to do it because I just know I'm going to put it off or not do it. Mm-hmm. So it's super cool to hear that you had these, all, it sounds like also seasons of writing too. Yeah, seasons of writing. And then my yoga teacher... And then my book coach, different months, both gave me like hashtag writing challenges. Um, And so the writing challenge was for both of them, different months to write every single day. Even if it's just writing for 10 minutes, put some energy into it. And then I would have to email them by the end of the day, like what I had done. And that really worked to know that there was someone on the other side Yes. They're not going to be mad at me or disappointed, but still, I was still like, okay, I like, I know there's someone on the other side. And I think just that practice of like daily writing, just like doing it because writing like anything else. And even for the folks that might be procrastinating is it's just, it takes practice. It's a habit. And I think for, oh, the other thing that really helped for me, a book coach said this to me. I can't remember who actually said it originally is write badly. 
Mm. And so there were times when I was struggling to sit down. I just remember right badly. I was like, I don't need to sit down and it needs to be like wonderful. I just need to sit down and write something down on the page. And yeah. that got me over that like writer's block or that stump every single time. Cause I was like, this could be garbage I'm writing down. But oftentimes I found even the first 20 minutes were a slog and something would happen. Like something like there would be like a little click over. Um, so writing badly really worked. Okay. While we were talking about this, I want to get back to asking you about your day to day. So like okay. when you have private clients, tell us a little, what, what does it mean to be a full-time yoga teacher? When people think you can, I imagine you to be like driving all over LA, which sounds really hectic for me. <laughs> and I would like never pick that, take that on. Or I just imagine, yeah, because we just had this conversation about what yoga means to me. If I were to practice yoga for three or lead yoga for three, five hours, like I imagine you to do. I think I would be like exhausted, I think. So I love to hear what it's like for you to have to be a full-time yoga teacher now for three years. Yeah. So I think that's the difference between being like a studio yoga teacher because to make ends meet as a studio yoga teacher, you are teaching like 20, 25 yoga classes a week. I just personally am not like a studio yoga person myself. That's not really like how I study myself or I practice. And I realized really early on, I love private clients. Like yoga, the way that I have learned it has really been taught like one-on-one. -on -one. So I have one-on-one -on -one clients. So either I'll see them on Zoom. When I lived in New Orleans, I had a little home studio. So like people would drive to me, which was oh, really cool. nice. Yeah. So I am in the works now of like potentially opening up something in the area. I've been like looking and like thinking about it. I run like online trainings, like I teach as a part of like workshops and like festivals and like retreats. I don't teach any studio classes because it's just not my vibe. I find it like very limiting. So there, I feel like I, my time, like I teach at mental health centers for teens, the autistic kids, and I try to like space it out in my day because I also love writing like when I was running the woman of color summit like writing blogs and posts and like social media because I feel like being like an entrepreneur business owner like you're wearing so many hats and so just finding that like balance to be able to wear all the hats and then being able to make it work in that way when you first started, how did you know you would be okay being a full-time yoga teacher in that even if you did the things that you did, go to the center, teach private Zooms, X, Y, and Z, that you would have energy at the end of the day even. I've been doing it for three years now and I love it. And I feel like I'm just not necessarily attached to it needs to look a certain way. I think what I'm more attached, not even attached, but what I'm more interested in is, is the person that or clients or center that I'm working with, like something I enjoy doing. And then there's both sides of it. Like, do I enjoy doing this? And also when I like write down, like how many clients do I have? How much am I making applying for grants and things like writing the book, the advance, and then thinking about like, how much do I actually need to make this all work? But that's also to say as a private yoga teacher, I'm definitely not making the amount someone working at like a tech company or working like in accounting is. So I definitely took like a pay cut, but for me, like just my day to day and being of service and like having energy at the end of the day and feeling like I'm doing fulfilling work is just so much more important. Um, and also I don't have kids like. Yeah, I just yeah, I just feel like right now for where I am, like it's working. And if things need to change, I can consider it at that point in time. Yeah, but it is working right now, thankfully. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay. When you said that, I really heard that I gave you energy, which makes sense because when I asked you that question, I came from a place where yoga mostly not depletes energy for me, but is yeah, but I use my energy on yoga. Yeah. yeah. And I, after teaching, I'm just, I mean, to be fair, like when I teach some of the teens, I'm just like pulling teeth the entire time. And I leave, I have like today I taught the teens and it was like, 
they were brought in programming that they were really interested in. So we're all laughing and being silly together. So when I left, I was energized. I have a private client I saw yesterday, a new one. And like, I left so energized. So I think it is important to like consider what gives us energy, what takes energy, what's neutral and to find that balance throughout the day. Cause like, I also don't pack my schedule with clients. I need that downtime. That's one reason I'm working for myself, not to pack my schedule. So like I'm working like a nine to five again. Yeah, I love that. Let's switch gears and talk about journaling. So I'd love to actually hear what your journaling routine was like before you had daily work journals. Similar. Yeah, I found the daily work journal, what's different it has, which I think you said, maybe you're not going to have it anymore. Like that weekly, weekly glance that really helped for me. So every Sunday I would sit down and write down, like, what do I have upcoming for the week? And the way that I journal and plan for the day, I do it the day before. So like maybe at the end of my, so maybe within the next like 10 minutes or maybe in an hour, I'm going to sit down, check off like everything that I finished. Okay. What am I going to work on tomorrow? And I always do it the night before. And then throughout the day, like this is never far for me. And I'm just checking off to this, making notes, which is why like I'm flying through them because they're just like super helpful. I take notes on the back. And then I also journal every single day. I journal for three pages and I bought a remarkable at the beginning of the year. And so I actually journal in there. Got it. Okay, cool. Yeah. That those are those look really cool. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Someone like in a retreat that I attended last year had it. And I was just like, oh my God, what is that? Yeah. Um, and yeah, highly recommend. Very cool. So what goes in the dotted line page of your notebook? Or what are you taking those of? On the back? The dotted page on the left-hand side of every spread before the daily look back. Oh, okay. So let me show you a page that's not stained. So I write down like on here, like carpenter man yoga, and then all the things I have to do, send out newsletter, apply to the grant. What time do I have? What time is the meeting with this client? And then I have something called spiritual self-care. And then I write down, I always have asana, meditate, Nadi Shodana, take vitamins, journal, blah, blah, blah. Then just like a to-do listed over here. So this is just, what do I have to do for the day is where it goes here. And then yeah. here, I don't actually use it. Like the, my takeaways, follow-ups here. I just take notes on whatever I have for the day. Got it. Okay. Throughout and the then day. you do the left-hand side the day before. Yes. Okay, cool. Yeah. Getting yourself really organized. Got it. Very yeah. cool. Wow. What have you, how has journaling impacted you? I just can't recommend it enough. Like I have journals. I think I started journaling after college and I still have all the journals. Um, and they're all, I finally took the time a couple months ago to organize them all. And I have them in a drawer over here. Mm-hmm. I think it's such a wonderful way. Like just the free writing journaling to like get what's in your mind out. I like problem solve. I write down what I'm grateful for. It's just like such a good way to dump things out. And then the daily work journal, like preparing for the day ahead, check like for me, I love checking things off. Even if I just did something and it wasn't written down, I will write it down, then check it off. Like I'm like, I did it. So it's a sense of like accomplishment, but I just, even with like, a team that I worked with today was my first time seeing him. I was like, do you journal? Do you have a journal? He's like, no. And I was like, bring a journal for next session. And we're getting into journaling. Um, Yeah. I think it's just, just, I don't know. I personally think it's so necessary. Yeah. And then this is something I ask all the guests. Do you look back on your journals? Do you have a routine of doing that kind of reflection? No, I don't. And what the one thing I can say, though, is I remember in Australia, writing down like what I wanted my life to look like. At that time, I think I was still at that tech company. I found that piece of paper, I want to say a year and a half, two years later, and everything that I had written on there was like how I was living my life at that moment. And so I was like, whoa, like, that's impactful. Yeah. Um, I got goosebumps. Yeah. And I, I feel like if I were to look through my journals, like I could get a lot out of it. I just haven't. I'm like, I just keep trekking forward, but yeah. I think it would be good. I think that's what most people do for sure. It goes back to the point of like, why do we journal or what do we want reflection to give us? 
And most people I talk to, the most I've heard is doing a reflection three months ago. So they might look at what they wrote three months ago, mm. but not what did they do years ago. That's it just, I think in that person's case, the reflection has been tracking. And so it was like not necessarily to do more work than you needed to if they already felt like it was happening. Yeah. Yeah. Now I'm inspired to go look through my old journals. I might <laughs> after I hop off. Yeah, I love that. Is there anything else you want to share? I feel like when newer yoga teachers or like people reach out to me, one of the things I do say a lot, there's no rush. Like there's no rush to like all of a sudden you're doing whatever you're, and you want to be a full-time yoga teacher now. Like what's the rush for? It's, I think for me, it was an organic process where it just made sense. And who knows, like in a year or two or three years from now, like if I will still be on this path, I would love to be, but I'm also open to the impermanence of life and change. I think allowing yourself to move slowly and not, and I I think that's the problem I feel with like social media, even, even how yoga teacher trainings are done now, where like whole modules are on like the business of being a yoga teacher. Right. It's these, I feel like false promises where it's, I feel like it's only a small percentage of yoga teachers making a shit ton of money and everyone else like getting, making enough to get by or making more than that, or people being like, oh, this is impossible. So I feel like it creates all of these like unreachable expectations So I think really figuring out like why you actually want to be doing this. What's your reason? And could this be done alongside something else that you're good at? Because I know for me, like I do this alongside with like when I had the Women of Color Summit, like that was like, like it was sales and event planning and so much more to it. And I feel like I've been able to be successful doing certain things because of my past skills. So using your past skills and and everything that you do. Do you ever have days where you don't actually want to be a yoga teacher? Of course. Mm. I just, I feel like I have, I'm going to take that back. I feel like I have days I don't want to do anything. (laughs) And that means any roles and responsibilities and like being a yoga teacher is still a role and responsibility. But I feel like when I really become clear on who I want to serve and what I'm interested in, yoga just fits so perfectly into that. And I have other things that I want to study, but it's all, it's just so connected to yoga that I feel very grateful. And I just, I just, I feel like all the type of work that I want to be doing is always going to be similar to this. So that feels really nice. Wow. That's so powerful. <laughs> I like, I'm glad that we both found that for us. Like when we are young, we were young and we are young and we were very young. Like for me, I'm grateful. I found coaching, Mm. like perhaps I could have done it younger, but I know actually it wouldn't have because of all the things it took me to get to that point. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we're like still really young. Yeah, absolutely. So Harpner, please share all about your social media handles and where to find you. And also tell us more about the book. If we want to, is the pre-sale wait list? How do we get on that? Yeah, absolutely. So you can find me at harpenderman.com. That's man with two N's. Um, on, I think all my social media profiles, I'm at harpenderman yoga. If you want to find out about my book, sign up for a newsletter. You can either do that in a link on my Instagram bio at harpenderman yoga or sign up on my website. And I send out monthly newsletters and then you can know when pre-sales are going to open up for the book so excited and I'll put it in the show notes so then we can just link it perfect 